So we have a guest speaker tonight, and I'm going to tell you truthfully, I don't know anything about him <laughs> other than I know he's an evangelist. I know he's preached in this area several times. His name is Ray Perryman, but I trust the person who told me he's a good man, and that's my brother, because <laughs> I know he's really ministered to my brother and to his family. And so um, Ray told Jeff a few weeks ago, he said, I think I have a word for salt of the earth. And I said, well, we always want to hear a word of the Lord. So he's going to speak tonight. So kids, I think you're going to stay in here because he's going to speak to all of us. And if they need to go out, we can turn the TV on over in the nursery and, you know, whatever. We'll just play it by ear about how, how it goes. We want everyone to experience uh, the presence of the living God. I've been in a conference the last three days in Oklahoma City, um, Oklahoma Apostolic Prayer Network Conference, and it was so powerful. And so I just, my cup is full. So I'm going to have to sit down so I won't start preaching. But I am thankful to see each of you here, and I know we're going to receive tonight. But it's just like when Jesus preached. You know, there were people that heard the exact same message that Jesus would preach, and there were some who received it, and they became transformed. And there were some who were skeptical and thought, you know, I think I'll go home and think about that. And then there were some who said, he's crazy. I don't believe a word he said. And they received nothing. And we have that exact same choice. We have that same choice, whether we want to receive from God or not. He never forces himself on us. And so we are going to decide, I hope, tonight to be transformed. Because if we don't come every time expecting God to change us and move us to a higher place, then we're wasting our time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and expect him to do great things tonight. Lord, you are a mighty, awesome God. We praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your loving kindness, for your tender mercy. And Lord, we thank you that we can trust you. Lord, forgive us for those times when we doubted you, when we didn't trust that you were a good God, when we thought, well, maybe he's not good. Maybe these bad things come from God. Lord, your word says, the Savior said, the thief is the one who kills, steals, and destroys. But you, Jesus, have come that we might have life and life more abundantly. So, Lord, just pour out your abundant life, and we will receive it. And let us not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds tonight. Just anoint the worship and anoint the word, and we give you all glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to say that it is an honor. and just I know how uh, big of a deal it is to let someone step up and share the word with the people whom God's given you to protect. And uh, I promise you, uh, we will only do as the Lord has given us and uh, we understand authority and we'll be submitted unto yours for sure. I want to share a couple of things with you before we get started. She asked me, she said, I don't know what to say about you. I said, well, there's really not much to say about me. Uh, I'm a nobody and uh, I dig that. I don't claim to be famous. I don't claim to be some guy that uh, has done any great thing. But what I do claim to be is dead. And I died to Ray a long time ago. And I allowed his spirit to come alive in me. And it changed everything about me. And in this place tonight, I'm going to encourage you. And I'm going to share some things with you. I want you to begin to see yourself as sons and daughters. Now, follow me because it's important that you get this. I mean, you've got to grab a hold of this. You say, well, Ray, what are you talking about? Well, because in the body today, what I see as I travel across the United States, I see what uh, I call, I'm not certain it's what God calls it, but I don't know what he calls it, but it's what I call it. I see an orphan spirit, okay? Now, an, and here's the way the Lord put it to me, and, and I need you to follow me because orphans have dreams, I dream of having a mom or a dad, or I dream of having my own house, and I dream of having enough groceries in the pantry that I have enough to eat. I dream of having new tennis shoes when I need them. I dream of having enough lunch money. Now, catch this, because this is where it gets really important. Sons have inheritances. Daughters have inheritances. Once we know who we are, once we've received, now listen to me, 
once we've received the spirit of adoption, only, only you can receive that. See, I would love to come in here today and say that I have this uh, Holy Spirit magic wand that I could just lay hands on you and you're going to receive the spirit of adoption, but that's not up to me. I had to years ago make a decision for myself, Jeff, that I would receive the spirit of adoption. And you know where I had to get? I had to believe that I was worth being adopted. Do you know how many people in this town are living the same way they have forever and you've passed by them and you've said out of your mouth they're no good and they absolutely, they're just, I mean, they're just a waste of our society and really what they are is someone who has never really seen who they are. And as they were worshiping, the Lord prompted me to speak this to this house, so I'm going to, so listen to me carefully. When the Lord gives something as precious as this place, you are to guard it very carefully and you are to pray over it. And don't you dare, listen to me, don't you dare allow the enemy to come in and ever allow division to have a place. If you see division, you cut its head off. You don't worry about blood splattering. You cut its head off and you sever it right there because God will use this place to go out and change this city. I guarantee you, if you will have the courage and the guts to simply stay where the vision that the Lord has given you, do not try to be something that you are not. You be whom God has called you to be. Now, before I get into, uh, I'm going to sing a song. And uh, you say, Ray, why would you sing? They did such a great job. Come from a prophetic word 20 some odd years ago from a man. And it's held true. So we always sing at least one song because it's part of the anointing. Uh, I don't understand it. So don't ask me because I don't get it. But it's true. So anyway, but before we do that, I want to share with you a vision. Now, if you're in here tonight. And you hear preachers talk about, and they say, well, the Lord gave me a vision, and you get boogered, all right? And you go to thinking, oh, my goodness, this is one of them snake candlers. All right, listen to me. Here's one thing I can promise you I am not. I am not a liar, and I'm also not crazy. So if I tell you something in this place, I promise you, you can take it to the bank that it is 100% true. And when I tell you that the Lord gave me a vision, this was probably the second vision in my time in ministry that the Lord's given me, and it was very profound, and I was standing there, and to my right, and I want you to see this with me, to my right was Calvary. And to my left was the Holy of Holies with the temple veil. And I knew that Christ had just died on the cross, and I turned. I, I, I didn't see Christ, but I knew he had just died, and I turned. And when I did, just like the Bible said, the temple veil had been torn from top to bottom, and I turned back to the right. Now, catch this, because it's so important. I looked up, and coming over the hill was people. And I'm talking about hitting a skip. You catching me? I mean, they were running. They, because why? Because they had heard for the first time in their life that they had been afforded the opportunity to go into the presence of God for themselves because of what Jesus had done. Now catch this. They were running. I'm talking about, and they'd hit that old curtain, and man, they wouldn't woe up. It was just, whoo, whoo. I mean, they was just going through, except some, they would run up to the curtain and stop, and they would stand there, and they were just doing this right here, and you could tell they wanted to go in so bad they couldn't stand it, but they would just stand there, and they stood there, and they stood there until somebody who had been in the presence of God come out. It's where it gets crazy. It's where some of y'all going to think I, I lost my, my jelly beans, all right? But they would grab them by the shoulders, the ones that had been in the presence. They'd say, you've got to tell me what it was like being in the presence of God. Please tell me. And those people would just begin to open up, and they told them. They said, you can't believe. said, what my father did to me for the first time in my life, I was able to forgive him by being in the presence of God. And they just went on about everything that God had done by being in his presence. Now, those people who wouldn't go beyond the veil, they grabbed a hold of them. As soon as they got through talking, this is what they did. They said... Let go and turned around and walked off. Now, I like y'all. I thought, okay, that's really neat, God. But I don't get it. Why are they sucking in air? And He said, listen to me. Now, follow me. He said, those people who would not go beyond the veil, 
is the church in America today. He said they show up every Sunday and he said they try to suck some life out of someone who has been in my presence and he said and they can't figure out why Monday nothing has changed in their life. He said everywhere you go you challenge my people to not stand outside the veil but to go beyond the veil to step into my presence because his presence is like sugar and peach cobbler. It changes everything. Are you catching my drift? His presence changes everything. If you want to see God do something in this town carry the presence of God with you when you go eat at the Mexican food restaurant carry the presence of God with you when you go to the convenience store if you'll take the presence of God with you I promise you will be how do we change this town one person at a time one one and we do that by letting his presence come So I'm going to ask if you would I know we've prayed a bunch but I'm going to ask you to just bow your head for a moment I do not ask you to bow your head and close your eyes so I can manipulate you. But I do ask you to bow your head and close your eyes so you can go to a place where you can focus. Where you can focus on what God is trying to say to you. See, Holy Spirit said to me about a year and a half ago, he said, Ray, I want you to challenge my people to raise their level of expectation to my level of ability. What?" What is God's level of ability? There's nothing impossible for God. What we see as challenging and difficult, he sees as a noun or an adverb or a simple breath. So tonight I'm going to ask you, what do you need for the Lord to do in your life? I didn't ask you about your wives. I didn't ask you about your mamas. I'm asking you for you. What do you need for him to do? Will you come with a level of expectation that meets his level of ability? And you may be sitting there tonight and you've been taught your whole life. You don't have the right to expect anything of God. You're wrong. I promise you, I have never been offended when my children had an expectation of me being a father. I was honored that they would expect me to do what a father does. He will not be offended if you come with an expectation of him to do what Abba Father does. What do you need? Think about it. Get it on your mind. Be purposed. What do you need? I mean, if you could ask him for something, what would you ask him for? What do you need? Now, Father, as we begin, I am honored. I'm honored to be in your presence. I'm honored that you came and you died on a cross. And you left, but you said it was better that you left because you were sending a comforter, one that would bring power, one that would be a teacher. Father, one that would live on the inside of us. So, Father, tonight we thank you for Holy Spirit. I ask, Father, that you would do amazingly wonderful things in this place. Father, I pray tonight that tangibly we would hear chains fall off of people who have been bound for years. And, Father, they've let no one see the shackles because they've learned to live with it. Father, let's don't learn to live with it. God, I pray tonight that we live tonight. And Father, we honor you for what you are going to do in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This song's called Forever. We're going to sing it and then we're going to get to the word. Mm. And I don't care how you worship, you worship. If you worship standing, stand. If you worship kneeling, kneel. I don't care. But don't be thinking about what you got to do after this and tell me you're worshiping because that's lying. Amen. Worship. Give me some of that. Bring it all. Let's get after it. The moon and stars they wept. The morning sun was day. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross. His blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse I found here. Feel this place. Feel this place. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A 
battle in the grave. A war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The crowd began to say the stone was rolled away. His perfect love would not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. To say the stones rolled away, his perfect love would not be overcome. Now, dead, where is your sting? Our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. Oh, Sing this with me. We sing hallelujah. Oh, let's hear you. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome again. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, let us seated if you want to. Come on, Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to step down here. I'm going to ever get down here with everybody if that's all right. Let y'all get there. Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to pray over this word while you're turning. I promise you, you won't go to hell for keeping turning while I'm praying. Father, we thank you for what you're about to do in this place tonight. Father, I have lots of opinions, but not one of my opinions is worth anything. But your word, a noun or an adjective from you, changes someone's life. So, Father, tonight, everything that is you, let them hear. Let them honor your word because it's worthy of honor. Father, I pray tonight that as you impregnate us with life, as you plant this seed of life on the inside of us, let us cultivate this seed. Let us tend to this seed so it can bring forth life throughout us, but not just for us, but for our families, our friends, our communities. Father, tonight, let this word spread like wildfire throughout this town. Now, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. If you agree, would you say amen? Joshua chapter 1 reads this way, and verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, now then, 
you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Now, there's a lot of places we could go with that, but I came tonight to share a specific way with you. Sometimes we read the word and it's just a story to us. And we think, oh, look at Joshua. Man, he got a promotion. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's sorry that he had to get his promotion with Moses, his best buddy, dying. But now, man, surely Joshua's got to be happy that he is now the man. El Jefe, the one, the one that's in charge, the one that's going to lead them. Now, catch this, to the promise. See, they've been looking for the promise since they left bondage. Okay, now follow me on this. But they could not get rid of themselves, and they continued to find themselves in bondage. How many of you have ever known someone, and you thought to yourself, man, why don't they just quit hitting themselves in the foot? I mean, well, why do they just keep doing this? Y'all ever known anybody like that? Raise your hand. I'm just curious. I want to know. Have you ever known somebody? Let's, let me just break this down. Let's maybe we'll, maybe y'all can relate a little better. Have you ever known a young lady and she was in a relationship with a man and he was an alcoholic and he was abusive and finally after he beat her the last time, she left and got out of the relationship and then about a year later she's in another relationship and it happens to be with the same kind of guy? Y'all ever known that before? Or am I the only one? It's only happened in Texas. And you're going, what are you thinking? Yeah, I grew up in a trailer park. I used to see it all the time. Oh, don't worry. Only Ed only hits me when he drinks. It's okay. Now listen to me. But they're continually running around in circles because they're in bondage to something. And they don't even know what they're in bondage to. Now, Joshua had always had a comfort blanket. Moses. Moses was the one that when there was a problem, it didn't stop at Joshua. I mean, daddies, y'all ever come home and wish the problems would have stopped at mama? Huh? You ever been there before? Have you ever been tired of being one and had to tear that booty up? Because in Texas, we take timeouts from whooping. We don't hand out timeouts, all right? But can you imagine? I mean, he was like, okay, I'm going to Moses. And he'd tell Moses, and Moses would tell him what the Lord had said. Now, all of a sudden, his comfort zone is dead. What he has always known was dead. Now, how many of you know much about dead things? Anybody? Any of y'all cattle people in here? Raise your hand. And he can raise them up. I'm not, we're not going to ask you to come give a lesson on it. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. For the rest of you who aren't, if you're weak stomach, bear with me because it's important. You'll understand why I'm being so graphic because too many times in church, we're very, we come to church and this is the way we act. We're like, oh my goodness. Now, I'm just not going to say anything about that because we're in God's house. This isn't God's house. This is a building. Okay. And the reason that the world isn't getting changed, it's because we're scared to death to talk about real things in our churches. All right? So just bear with me. So if you're offended, don't blame her. She didn't know anybody. Blame Jeff. All right? <laughs> now, but follow me. Have you ever seen an old dead cow in July? Have you? you did you say you smelled one? Yes, ma'am. How about one of them that bloats? I'm talking, yeah, uh-huh. Somebody's going, oh, my goodness, that is so nice. I'm so glad that you're saying that because bear with me. You will understand why I'm being very graphic with you in just a moment. Can you fathom that big old dead bloated cow? If you think they stink when they're dead and bloated and the buzzards have been eating at his rear end, just walk up and poke him in the side and let that thing bust. Oh, my goodness. You'd be like, oh, man, Lord, that a gag of maggot. Mm, that is just, mm, because it's dead and it's ugly. Now, here's something else I know. Bear with me. I know, just remember, I never went to preaching school, but just bear with me. I got a point, all right? So all of a sudden, can you fathom what would happen if you just dove off in that old dead carcass? Because that was your favorite cow. Here's what I know about death, ma'am. You let something die and let it rot, it'll grow a bacteria even though it used to bring you 
life. You hear me? Now follow me. I got a point. She may used to give you the best calf that you ever had. She may used to have weaned you absolutely the most incredible calf at the largest weight that rung a bell every time. Everybody wanted the calves out of her because they were awesome. But when you let her die and she begins to rot and when she's dead, if you're not careful and you're messing around with her, if you take her with you before too long, bacteria is there and you'll begin to contaminate everything that you touch. Now follow me. So Joshua is hanging out. Can you imagine? How many of y'all love blunt people? Any of y'all love blunt people? I do. If you don't like blunt people, you won't like me. But I hate two-faced people. I'm not. And you say that's a strong word. I mean every word. I, I cannot stand two-faced people. If you like me, tell me you like me. If you don't, man, that's cool. But tell me what to say. Don't beat around the bush with it. And you know what? God isn't two-faced. God doesn't beat around the bush. Isn't it funny how he told Joshua that absolutely his comfort zone was gone? He goes, Moses is dead. He didn't say, well, Moses had a cough for about a week. Moses, oh, his blood pressure was up and he was battling the diabetes. We got him on a ventilator. We don't know if he's going to make it. I'm just preparing. You know he said he's dead. Because here's what I know about God. There is a season and a time for everything. And if you are not careful, you will carry dead things into a season that God meant for life to be in. And you contaminate everything that you touch. Could you imagine Joshua looking at Moses and saying it's not fair that I am going to go and I'm going to go into the promise and how am I going to lead these people? After all, Moses is the one who has done this. Moses is the one who's made the decision. Moses is the one who God has spoken to. Listen to me. Can you imagine? Just follow me because back then they didn't have embalming fluid. Can you imagine him loving Moses so much that he just picked him up and he said, boys, we can't leave him here. He's been such a good Moses. i got to put him on my shoulder shoulder and we're going to carry him across because he deserves to be in the promise that Moses absolutely oh my goodness we can't leave him here I know he's dead but oh we just got to take him with us everywhere we go we don't want to forget Moses we better take him with us I promise you it won't be too long Moses is going to be like that old dead cow in July he's going to begin to bloat and he's going to begin to stink what you used to love and what used to complete you and what God meant for you for a season if you're not careful it will keep you from the very promise that God has given you are you catching me now long time ago I was stouter than I am now turned 51 the other day and I get out of wind a lot quicker than I used to and I can't lift what I used to but here's what I know, even when I was stouter, even when I was like that young stud duck bull that felt like I was blowed up like a tick on Dracula, I promise you there's no possible way that I could walk farther carrying a dead man that I can without him. Do you understand? And God said, every place that I get, every place you set your foot, I'm going to give to you as I have already promised Moses. Do you think for one moment that Moses was wanted them to let him contaminate or lessen the blessing that God had for them? No. Here's what Moses would have said. Why don't you bury me? Hello? Brother Ray, I just don't understand why we're talking about death and burial. I mean, I'd love to understand what this has to do with my life, really. I'm glad that you asked because maybe we'll just visit that for a moment. Some of us, God has given us a promise. But we keep carrying something dead that our daddy did to us when we were 10 years old. We walk and we say that we have found freedom. But what we have become is our identity has been found in our victimhood. You hear me? 
You see, if we're not careful before too long, we'll let what an old relationship did to us absolutely steal a promise that's ahead of us. Oh, but you don't understand. I just loved them so much. And I would just, I mean, I can't let it go. And, and besides, you know, the other thing is, I, I know that, man, I know God sent me the greatest woman in the world. But every time I start to let my guard down, I think about what that woman did to me in the last relationship. And I just, oh, I, I got to keep my guard up because ain't nobody ever going to hurt me again. When are you going to dig a hole and frap it bury what God has said is dead in your life? When are you going to get rid of the contamination and quit taking it to the promise? Because here's what, now listen to me, here's where it gets real good. Before I went into ministry, my business was people's hearts. Started out working in the open heart room. I moved to doing cardiac and vascular ultrasound for a living. And then I went into ministry. But when I scrubbed years ago, when you scrub, it's very important. You wash your hands a certain way. You put on your gown a certain way. You put on your gloves a certain way. And when you're setting up a table to prepare to do open heart surgery on someone, the table starts again. Some of you are wondering what this has. So far, everything I've told you has had a meaning, so just bear with me. So the table would start here, and it would go to about right here. And on that table, we would have a drape. It was sterile. That means that there were no bugs on it, no bacteria, no infection could be and we would spend literally 45 minutes to an hour setting up every instrument that we would need everything in stages to do open heart surgery on someone and it was very important that no one contaminated your sterile field because if you've ever seen a sternum that gets infected it's ugly and it takes forever and it has to stay open it's a horrible thing to allow contamination into something that was meant to be sterile do you understand and there was this nurse I'll never forget her and she was absolutely the sweetest girl in the world but when I tell you she was ditzy I don't mean a little I'm talking about a lot and I don't know how she made it through school but she did and she was always wanting to talk and I was scrubbed and I'm working and I'm the kind of guy that I don't like laziness I just want to work and she always wanted to visit blah 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 and she's standing there she's not scrubbed in she's not sterile she's standing here at the edge of my table and I'm working and I've been I mean, busting my tail to get ready. The patient's fixing to come in. We're fixing to intubate them. We're fixing to rock and roll. And it's crazy enough when you got everything ready. And she's sitting there and she goes, well, you know, Ray, she touched the corner of my table. Now listen to me. It was just the corner. This part right here. You saw how big that was, right? How big my table was? She just touched the edge of it. If that was your heart that we were fixing to cut into, would you want to take a gamble that the whole table had not been contaminated? Let me help you. The answer would be no. When someone contaminates even a small portion of your table, it had to be considered that the whole sterile field was contaminated. Catch me. When we don't deal with even a little dead thing in our life when we want to take even a smallest dead thing with us into what God has promised we are contaminating everything that God has for us and we're lying to ourselves. and you say how do you know because I've lived it I understand when we tell ourselves oh it's not that big of a deal I promise you it's that big of a deal God gave you a promise that every place that you set your foot he would give to you and how dare we carry even the chance of contaminating something as beautiful as the very promise of God I wonder what would happen in this place today if we honestly began to deal with dead things in our life we've got an 18 year old boy at the house he's the last of the Mohicans and he's a good looking kid I ain't lying. This is a studly looking kid, big old stout jaw in him, just a good looking kid. But for whatever reason, the other day, he's like, man, I ain't put deodorant on in three days. (laughs) 
Ma'am, I had the same look that you're looking at me. I was like, I know you're not stupid. I know what your genetics are. He goes, I said, son, you just think. Put some, oh, no, I'm just going to put some cologne on. Now you smell like body odor with cologne on. Catch me. When we bring dead things in, but yet other places in our life seem to be so super spiritual and submitted to God, it still stinks to high heaven to our Father above. Because here, catch me, what we're telling him is I will trust you with most everything, but this one thing is my comfort zone. This one thing is what I have always known. This one thing I cannot let go of. This one thing is more my identity than you will ever be. Because, see, there's a certain part. If you're going to give God something dead, you must have a very simple word called trust. But by nature, people who've had a bunch of dead things in their life, trust doesn't come easy. When you've walked through hard times in your life, When it seems like you have been wounded more than you have been blessed. Trust isn't easy. But trust is not an option. Trust is something that God requires from us. Because he is a good father. He would never leave you. He will never forsake you. And if you will trust him with the dead things in your life. Where there used to be death. He will bring life. But you're the only one. Now hear me, if anybody tells you differently, they're wrong. Promise you, read the book, see if I'm right or wrong. Jeff, I'd give anything to be able to dig a grave and bury what you need to bury. But that ain't my grave. I got enough stuff that I have to deal with digging. Sometimes, spiritually speaking, my hands are literally hurting because God said, that's dead. Why are you carrying it? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just been with me for a long time. Have any of you guys ever gotten the back seat of your pickup? Have y'all ever looked in the back seat of your pickup? There's stuff back there that you have no idea why it's there, but you needed it at one point, and it absolutely has just stayed with you forever. When will we get rid of the stuff that's dead and is just dead weight? When will we dig holes and bury them? You say, why do you keep talking about burying? Because here's what I know. The other thing that I see is I see people in the body of Christ today and they put their dead things on display. Are you hearing me? You catching me? Oh, I just want you to know that God has set me free. Can I tell you what I walked through a long time ago? And there's still a portion of me that I deal with it. But I just feel the need to tell everyone. Do you? I, can I just, I want to tell you about this dead thing in my life. And I think God's screaming out, will you begin to tell them about the life? that's in you and bury those dead things because if you'll begin to talk about the things that are life in you and bury the dead things that's when the promise will be found hello is it easy I wish I could tell you that it was I will not lie to you I walked through a very difficult time about 12 or 13 years ago I thought 12 or 13 years ago that my life would never be the same and that God would have no use for me. Until one day I was able to take that time and dig a hole and say, if God said I'm his son, why would I want to carry around something that is dead and ugly with me for the rest of my life when he told me that it wasn't mine to bear? But if you just won't keep on suffering for Jesus, you go right ahead. Have at it. I don't find that to be a whole lot scriptural to carry around dead things. I find if you're going to suffer for Jesus, that means that you are absolutely suffering to let that dead stuff go because sometimes it hurts. But the problem is, now catch me and I'm closing. 
The problem is, the reason it hurts so much is because we've never figured out who we are without it. I mean, after all, read the book. I challenge you, go read the book from the time they, they left, and you'll hear Joshua and Moses, Moses and Joshua, Joshua and Moses. They were inseparable. They were a part of each other. See, sometimes there's a portion of our life where God says that season is over. And if you want to continue in that season, you will miss the promise that I've always intended you to have. Do you understand what I'm telling you? But it will hurt. Some things, now catch this, some things that you need to bury, it doesn't mean that they are horrible people. It doesn't mean that they're horrible things. It just means that God said they're toxic to you. Hello? I've had some really good things in my life, and God said, Ray, that's toxic to you. Bury it. And I was like, but I don't want to bury it. He said, I know. You found your identity in it more than in me. Bow your head, close your eyes, I'm done. Please. Young lady, if I said, please, will you play something for me? Thank you, ma'am. All across this place tonight. I promise you I did not come here just to come. I came here intentionally. And I would be willing to bet that setting in this place that there's a bunch of you who know about some dead stuff that you're carrying. Man, it doesn't make you unsaved and man it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human. But God's wanting to do so much more in you. But God will never, listen to me, God will never be able to do what he's wanting to do in you, around you, or about you until you're willing to bury the things that he has said is dead. So tonight, I want to ask you, just real simple, if you're in this place and you say, Ray, I look, please be honest. I mean, it's not like God doesn't already know. I mean, you can sit in this place tonight and go, man, it's a coincidence that that guy's here. Or you can go, man, ain't it cool that God loves me enough that he called me to get a shovel because it's time for me to bury some stuff. So if you're in this place, you go, Ray, I know I've got some dead stuff. I know that I have some things that I need to bury. If that's you, when I count to three, here's what I'm going to simply ask you to do, and I won't embarrass you, I promise. 24 years in ministry, I hadn't been in ministry that long, embarrassing people I'd never do. I just want to see your hand from me. If you're in here tonight and you say, Ray, I've got some dead stuff and I know I know I need to bury it. I know I do. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to just simply raise your hand up high. One, two, three. Just raise it up. Yes, yes. Yep, everywhere. Everywhere. Yep, yep, they're everywhere. Sure they are. Yes, they are. You bet. Now, put your hands down. going to ask this question because I've never been anywhere that I didn't ask it. So if you're in this place tonight and you say, Ray, dude, I got to be honest with you. All this stuff about burying dead things, uh, Ray, I, I don't really know that I'm saved. I mean, I don't know that I've ever asked Christ to live on the inside of me. But Ray, I want to. Ray, I want to know that I'm forgiven. 
Ray, I want to know that the very spirit of the living God resides on the inside of me. If that's you and you're in this place tonight, I'll ask you once and I promise I won't ask again. If you don't know if you're saved, when I count to three, I want you to just simply raise your hand up high. One, two, three. Anywhere. Thank you, baby. Thank you, baby. Anywhere else? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anywhere else? Yes. Yes. Now put your hands down if you would. Would you stand to your feet? Pastor, could I have you? Now listen to me carefully. If you would, would all of you stand to your feet? Just stand to your feet. If you if you have, if you're older and you need to sit, that's fine. I'm a big believer in this simple statement. To get where we're going, it's important to leave where we're at. Just very simple statement. So tonight I'm going to offer you the opportunity. I saw every hand, every hand. I told you I wouldn't embarrass you and I won't. But I saw every hand that said, Ray, I need to bury something. So as she plays, sings, whatever she's going to do, I want to open up the front of this church. This is an altar. If you want to pray with me, you can, but to be honest with you, it's not me you need to talk to. I can't bury what you need to bury. It's none of my business what you need to bury, but I promise you, here's what I know. If you simply cry out to God, just get real with Him. Don't beat around the bush with him. He said, Moses is dead. Tell him, say, Lord, the relationship with my ex-wife is killing me. Tell him. Whatever it is. Dig a hole and bury it. Don't even put a tombstone over it. Just bury it.